Hello everyone and welcome back or welcome if it's your first time. Today we're going to be talking about books. Whose books? My books. Um, so many of you know, uh, if you're following this channel or have been for any period of time, you know that uh, I write books uh, and that I have been writing books for over a decade at this point. About 13 years. And this right here, this beefy stack is all of the books that I have ever published um, or participated in publishing and um, wow my battery is already about to die which is kind of crazy so we're gonna try and speed through this one and I'm going to place an order for new batteries for my camera. Let's go ahead and begin. Let's start with the first books that I ever worked on. You can actually see this one's got some wear and tear on the spine, or maybe you can't, I don't know. Um, and this one is called Dangerous Catch, Deep Sea Fishers. It's by Time for Kids, by me. Um, and this book is awesome. Look, you can even see, <laughs> you can even see this ancient ass picture of me way back in the day. It says, dead name, is a student in Las Vegas, Nevada, a proud member of her school's ROTC program. From an early age, she had an interest in writing. She's currently in the process of writing a novel, aren't we all? Uh, she loves to spend weekends out on the water fishing, which is not fucking true. I actually get really seasick. This book was really fun to write, though. It was my first introduction to mainstream publishing and what it looks like to write for a living. I got paid $1,800 as a 16-year-old to write this book. It was 2011 when they contracted me for this bad boy, November of 2011. Actually, October technically, it was due November 11th. And I know that because they contracted me last minute. The person who initially signed up to write that book had a family emergency, wasn't able to complete it. And so instead of the usual four weeks to write it, I only had two, um, or something to that effect. Maybe instead of six weeks, I only had four. Either way, I banged that sucker out. I even managed to snag an interview with a person who had been a deep sea fisher. No, I don't even think we included his interview. I think we did a different interview that the editor managed to snag. Um, yeah, the editor managed to snag a different interview, so we didn't even include that in here. Anyway, all of these books that I wrote for Teacher Creative Materials and Time for Kids, um, don't get me wrong, they have some merit, but they were heavily, heavily, heavily edited to the point that I think even the most recent one that got published has a second author name on it. That's the editor, Tori Maloof. Um, because I was so brain rotted from Fox News that writing about the Great Leap Westward, I ended up coming out with some like really racist shit. Um, so yeah, I, will I say that I'm proud of these? Um, I'm proud of how they ended up, um, for sure. Uh, thanks in large part to the amazing editing team at Teacher Creative Materials. They would not be what they are without those people. I very much was a teenager with Fox News brain rot, writing books for kids with zero degree, and uh, it showed. It 100% reflected in uh, the way that I pulled sources and the <laughs> things that I wrote in those books. So yeah, but let's, let's just take a little tour through them really quick. We had, so Deep Sea Fishing was the first one. Settling and Unsettling the West. Americans were fed up with crowded eastern cities. They wanted to adventure new opportunities, but to find that they had to give up their old way of living. They packed their belongings and made the dangerous trek westward. What started as the search for a better future changed the course of American history. That part I actually wrote. That's like completely unedited. I remember reading these books and being so bothered that they were so heavily edited, but they needed it. Like looking back, I don't even have my old drafts, but if I did, man, I would probably burn them. Um, the Spanish-American War, what would you do if the place you live was taken over by a brutal military force? Would you ask the world for help? What if you needed, what if you were 
the place being asked to help. Would you rise to the occasion? That's exactly what Florida did. I did not write that. That definitely was not written by me. American Indians of the West battling the elements. American Indian tribes of the West lived in five vastly different types of environments. They developed different ways of life to survive. They lived off the land and had large trade networks. But when European settlers arrived, their lives and the West were changed forever. Uh, I don't think I wrote that either. So these books, because they were so deliciously edited by somebody else, um, actually have like really great content and you should definitely read them. Um, but when I wrote them, they did not. Uh, the Great Leap Westward. The 1800s was a century of discovery and expansion in the United States. The country grew in size through battles, negotiations, and large land purchases. In less than 70 years, the small East Coast nations spread westward to reach the Pacific, and it was all in the name of Manifest Destiny. That part I did write. Um, Alright, so the next book, Florida and the Early 20th Century, Boom and Bust. America went from a lively, buzzing country to dusty, dying, poor man's shanty. Why did this happen? How did Florida fare during this boom and bust? Explore the ups and downs of this great nation and the state of Florida from the Roaring Twenties to the Great Depression and beyond. That bit I did write. It's actually one of my least edited books, uh, but there are still things in here that I definitely did not put in my original, in original layout. Um, I also did not source my own images uh, for most of these books. I did source Let's see if it's even in here. Yeah, no, it's not. The image that I did source for this book, uh, Deep Sea Fishers, uh, was just like a personal photo from somebody, uh, and because they couldn't cite it, they didn't include it. It also probably wasn't high enough quality. I'm pretty sure it was a cell phone photo. Uh, and then the last one here, uh, Savannah, hosts the city of the South. Savannah has a long history and a rich culture. Discover both as you travel from colonial Savannah to the modern city as it is today. You'll know, you'll soon know why the host of City of the South attracts so many people to visit and live. I did not write that. Um, but again, this is one of my least edited books, interestingly enough. Um, so those are the first books that I ever published. They're all nonfiction. They're all for use in the classroom. They've all been translated to Spanish as far as I understand, um, but they're not for sale anymore. You can find them on Amazon. I also link to them on my um, website. Obviously, I can't sell copies myself because I don't own the rights to these. I was paid as a contractor to write these books. When I signed up to, when I applied to write for teacher creative materials, I did not think I was going to get it. I applied to be an author for this company um, and won a spot against like a bunch of other people who actually write professionally and I was very shocked. Which means that I was and am, but even back then I was a good writer, I just was misguided. <laughs> Those were the first ever nonfiction stuff that I wrote. I am interested in producing children's books. Again, I'm currently working on some fiction children's books, but I would like to switch to writing some nonfiction children's books because I really did enjoy that. The prospect, though, of sourcing images and requesting permissions to use images definitely stresses me out, and I'm considering figuring out how to produce my own images for books, but it's a process. The next thing that I published after writing children's nonfiction was erotica. Huge difference in things. And actually, I published a series of three books under the name Heather Holly to Barnes and Noble. They're no longer available, but they were three eroticas, and one of them was The Bunny and the Bachelor. I've since rewritten The Bunny and the Bachelor. This one came out, uh, I published in December of 2021, and this one is gay. The original Bunny and the Bachelor is straight and just not great, honestly. This one is the gay and much uh, nicer version of that one. This story follows a beautiful bear and a smallish trans guy. When Avi gets a concussion on the front steps of his apartment building and winds up in the wrong apartment, Adan offers to take him take care of him overnight. What will happen when two lonely guys bond over holiday break? I'm sure you can guess. This heartfelt and steamy short story is sure to keep you cozy this snowy season. This one is way cuter, a lot less creepy, and just overall wholesome and enjoyable, even with its rated R content. She's Not Here, I published at the beginning of 2021 for my birthday. This book contains poetry and commentary by 
JB Lettercast, which was the original name that I started writing these books under. A transgender man in his late 20s, these poems were written between the years of 2011 and 2021, and there's a quote from me at the back uh, as well that says, I'm letting myself be visible for the first time, I'm terrified, I'm exhilarated, I'm relieved. And uh, that's the back there. I designed all of this myself. I really, really think this is some solid cover design, even though it was done in Canva. I do most of my designing in Canva. And it's just a book of poetry. And essays about those poems. And it was just like a really cathartic release. Just kind of like talking about being trans, talking about my life experience. Um, and how these poems kind of relate to those. The next book was 400 Year Frost. This is the first edition cover. I think it's kind of cute. It is a little, a little bit boring though. And here is the second edition cover. Um, I have since updated my name to Zach Lettercast, so anything that says JB Lettercast, uh, I just have being as co-authored on Amazon by me. Hey, what you doing? Oh, Grumble. Are you grumbly? She's a grumbly cat. Come here. Over here. Yeah. Oh my goodness. You're so yelly. She was also covered in dirt because we went outside this morning and she rolled around in dirt. She's that kind of cat. Her sister's not. Her sister won't roll around in dirt, but she will. So as you can see, the original cover just has this like lengthy author bio on the back. It gets shorter every time I publish a book, to be honest. Also an old photo, but the uh, the general back matter is the same. Peter Garrison was lucky enough to get one of the last tickets aboard the final seed ship to leave the dying earth. He was unlucky enough to be the only survivor when that very same seed ship dove face first into a star. Now he must learn to survive on a strange lonesome planet and hope that someone, anyone, will come save him. But will his, rescuer, will his rescuers be amiable? Will he ever reunite with his family? What hope could there possibly be for the last man alive? I loved writing this book. Uh, it is a really, really good story. It is obviously short, short story. And this was kind of my first realization that while I can write novels, I'm not a novel writer. I'm not. I have a novel coming out, hopefully at the end of this year, or beginning of next year. But I am a short story author through and through. And there is a real value to short stories that I think a lot of people don't seem to like really comprehend. You know, you think, oh, the great American novel, and it's like, yes, but if we look into like American history, the great American short story is really the backbone of a lot of American culture. So, short stories. I write them, I'm proud that I write them, I want to see other people write them, and this is also why I participate in a lot of anthologies, I try to build my own anthologies, and I read anthologies. So the next one was Falling Into a Winter Sky. This is an anthology that was organized by HHBS Publishing. This one actually probably came out before these guys, to be honest, because it's published under Ivo Lettercast, but the copyright date is later than those books, so I'm not really sure what's up with that. But here is the uh, back matter. As pale snow gently falls against a harsh landscape, a fire burns in the hearts and souls of those that need the warmth. With long dark nights ahead and endless hours of unkempt time, this anthology is sure to warm you from the inside out. Journey with these amazing authors as they weave the tale of winter and the dangers and desires she hides in every corner, she being winter, got it. The titles here are Parker's Eventful Christmas, Evan's Blue, Winter Engagement, Crawling Destiny, Ascend from Madness, Arachnopocalypse, that's me, Know Thyself, The Devil's Ride, In His Lifetime, and A Fated Tragedy. So this was my first foray into the Ara Arachnopocalypse universe. I wrote this short story thinking it would just be a short story, and from that grew an entire timeline and a universe that I had the honor of writing with a series of other authors in um, in my Arachnopocalypse anthology. So the story that's in here is actually Arachnopocalypse Violet Winter. So this is the first edition of that story in this book. It's no longer something you can purchase, by the way. Um, so sucks to suck. The next one is Falling Into a Spring Sky anthology. And let me tell you, homie, I don't like the cover design on either of these. The back matter is fine. I like that it's got, you know, all the different books. I like that it's got this little, like, separator. 
Um, but the general design of these books is really clunky, uh, and so every every time I pick them up, I'm just like, it's not great. So here is Falling Into a Spring Sky. I mean, look at that text. It's like a Wattpad cover made by a 12-year-old. I hate it. When the chill of winter fades, spring blooms into focus, bringing, it, bringing with it new life and a promise of warm weather and bright beginnings. Join these talented authors as they welcome the last of our seasonal anthologies with stories sure to carry you through all the seasons of life, love, wonder, and more. The Devil's Plan, Spring Wedding, Destiny Found, Justine, Arachnid Apocalypse, Ochre Spring, Lupercalia Deatis Mori, Itasha's Gift, and Wither and Bloom, again by HHBS Publishing. I actually haven't read the other stories in this one, but Lupercalia Deatis Mori sounds like a Warhammer book? Uh, and now I'm interested, and I might actually read that. Those are the two anthologies that kind of like sparked me into Let's write Iraq Apocalypse, let's build anthologies with other people. This is one of my smallest books. It is called It Feeds. I'm super fucking proud of this cover. I think it's really amazing. I made it in Canva back when Canva was still figuring its shit out. So I am really, really, really proud of the design because it took hours. I mean, that sword did not look like that when I downloaded the file. This one actually has an excerpt in it from the book. Tall sharp spires of torn rusty metal shot up around them like a crown, like teeth as the pitch and flickering red beacon lights swallowed them up. Despite the closeness of the campus to what was deemed the most dangerous place aboard the Verena, it was still a two-day trek from the Clerk College of the Arts to their new home, the Tower. The place was drawing him in, and he knew it. Carefully, he unsheathed his sword and wrapped the rosary around the hilt. The threshold was in sight, and its portcullis was wide open, gaping, hungry. Follow Lewis's har harrowing journey into the heart of the tower, where he vows to vanquish the warp beast that slew his battalion's leader. It Feeds is a short, gritty horror that will fuel your nightmares for years to come and leave you wanting more. Author note, I might continue Lewis's story or that of the Verena, or maybe even other tower tales if this one receives enough interest. It did not receive any interest. I think three people have bought this book. Three. That is crazy to me. It Feeds is an amazing short story, and people just don't read it. I don't know if it's that they're not interested in the cover, or if they, they don't like that Lewis's name has two L's in it, or if they don't like that it is, uh, it is a true stor short story. It is only 21 pages long in this format. Um, but this is like a really spectacular book. I also just realized I don't think I have a copy of the polyamorous romance science fiction book that I just published this year. So I will, I don't have a copy of it, which is freaking crazy. I will include a screenshot of that one when we get to it. So next is an anthology that I organized myself with a group of other author friends called Despite the Cold. I also designed this cover. I'm actually really proud of it. It gives me kind of like, I don't know, 80s vibes or something. It, uh, it makes me think of those cups that used to exist. Those like white cups that have like that weird like scribbly on them. I don't know, but it's uh, a mountainscape, which is really cool. Also did this with Canva. Again, really, really freaking proud of the cover design, especially the border around the edge, which like turns into like a solid spine. That took so much effort because I didn't have a cover size like estimator, so I had to just like trial and error that shit. Um, I have since learned <laughs> some tools of the trade, but that is why this back <laughs> is not centered. For this cover, I actually, um, instead of including book titles and author names on the back like a normal person, I just included little taglines for each book, which uh, now that I'm looking at it is kind of like, eh. A little annoying. Soulmates destined to search for each other across time and space. Dot dot dot. A man struggling to survive on a desolate planet light years from home. Dot dot dot. The intrepid crew of a seed ship fighting against the odds. Dot dot dot. The next door neighbors who harbor secret feelings for one another. Dot dot dot. A transmasculine top and a bear who both just want to be loved. Dot dot dot. An unexpected visitor amidst holiday festivities. Dot dot dot. Love will always win, despite the cold. And I'm also actually really proud of the background of this guy. 
um, like behind the text. That took a lot of effort to get all of those like vector images to do what I wanted them to. This is actually a signed first edition by all of the authors. Super cool. If you'll notice though, I didn't write anything new for this one. Books that I've already talked about were included in this anthology. And I also... <laughs> I also did not include, believe it or not, a table of contents. So this is my first attempt at anything like this, and yeah. The inside is really pretty though, as you can see. Like, look at that. Look at how nice that is. Um, so we have Forever in the Aftermath by Kit Branish. Look, I even put the author's name and the title of their work on the headers, which is like a thing. And I included page numbers in this one, which I definitely neglected to do in some previous editions of the other books. All right, so that's Forever in the Aftermath. What's next? 400 Year Frost by yours truly. No Place Like Nomion by Nikita Spoke. Snowed In by Elijah Rhodes. The Bunny and the Bachelor by Lucian Flam. That is the name that I used to publish my erotica uh, exactly once. And Never Again, because I decided I didn't want to write erotica. And Jill Robinson's The Kissing Ball. So, all right, next, my pride and joy. Arachnopocalypse. As you can see, this is my... I've, I have given away so many copies of this book because I just want people to read it, you know what I mean? Um, so here's the title uh, bit, which I'm like really proud of also. Um, and of course, the back, Arachnopocalypse. The original, original uh, version of this book actually had like a very good collab books logo and was like, we're always looking for new authors. I've since retired the Very Good Collab Books program, but that is the program that I used to publish my anthologies. So this, I actually commissioned the art from a person who does uh, concept art for all kinds of different science fiction stuff. His last name is Gambino. He actually just came out with his own book, finally. Everybody's super excited about it. And it is titled The Dark Shepherd. And then here's the back matter. Um, what has eight legs, violet blood, and too many bionic eyes to count? First contact was only the beginning. Watch humanity's fight to survive as the arachnids wreak havoc on planet Earth. These nine tales paint a vivid and gory picture of life in the arachnopocalypse. And then I just love that you've got this little guy right here above the he was, uh, the um, ISBN where he's just like glowy eyes. Like I said, pride and joy here. Obviously there are other things. I'm, I'm proud of everything I've written um, and published, but this one was like a two year long process and um, I still managed to get other people included in it, which is really cool. Uh, myself, Justin Sloan, C.W. Hawes, and Maria G. Oriana. Um, all participated in this in this book. Look at that. It's got a copyright page. It's got a table of contents. It has page numbers, which is great, and it has author names and book titles or story titles in the headers. Fantastic. Looking at it now, I, w I wish that I had put the the page numbers at the bottom centered, but I got them on the outside of each page. And then it also has a unique um, page for the beginning of each chapter, which I don't know how well you can see it, but it does um, show up here on the side, which is really nice. Just gives it some variation. So we've got Violet Winter by myself, The First of Us by Justin Sloan, Ochre Spring by myself, um, Galena by C.W. Hawes, Icor Summer by myself, Companion by Merlin Spoke and Zach Lettercast. Um, weird that Merlin is not listed at the very beginning, but he is listed on the cover, so that's uh, something that I never caught. Uh, Viridian Fall by Yours Truly, Remainder of the Day by Yours Truly, and Red Dust Child by myself with Maria G. Oriana, who is a non-native English speaker, who I was super excited to participate with. All of these people, you can find links to them, to their websites, to their work, on my website, if you scroll down to the Very Good Collab Project tab on my website, you'll be able to see images um, that are clickable 
of every person I've ever written with, and yeah. So, my dedication in this book says to my young self and to anyone with a story inside them waiting to see the light of day, write what you love, damn the naysayers. And this really harkens to what inspired me to write Arachnopocalypse in the first place, which is Warhammer 40k. I genuinely did not think that there was a market for the type of stuff that I liked to read um, out there in the world. I love grimdark content. It is just deliciously satisfying. I thought that that really only had a place in a film and, and like in the niche communities of like Warhammer 40k and Warhammer Age of Sigmar. But as it turns out, um, people do actually like Arachnopocalypse. I think I've sold like 78 copies of this book since releasing it for the second time in 2022. That is a lot more than I ever expected to sell. And so yes, it just, I am super pleased with this book. Uh, and eventually I'm sure I will return to the Arachnopocalypse universe, but for the time being, I am satisfied with this particular product. Next up is a book of poetry titled Wheel. This is the cover again. I've given out a lot of copies of this one. Um, it's a pretty simplistic cover. I like the colors. I've since released an updated cover with a new, like, Zach Lettercast name and new back matter. This one says, when we find love in this crazy, miraculous life, let's try to enjoy it in the moment where we find it and let it be whatever we need it to be at that moment. This book is a response to just a significant amount of loss that I experienced over the course of um, really from 2018, 2019 through 2022 and just kind of like reflecting on the cycles that I had found myself in, in terms of seeking validation, seeking affection, seeking, you know, affirmation, I guess, from other people. Uh, and my codependent tendencies, and it's dedicated to the names I may never again speak, which is kind of a reflection on the people I've been with and the changes that they've gone through, and uh, the people who either I have gone in contact with or who have gone in contact with me. There's a lot of really decent poetry in here, I think. I don't think I actually have... Oh, I do. I have reflections at the end. And some of them, I mean, it's always gonna be cringe when you write your own poetry and then reflect on it and then publish it and like expect people to read it. So obviously, it's similar to She's Not Here, it is a cringe book, but it is, you know, it is a book and it is poetry and I think the poems are actually pretty decent, so. The next one is the last anthology that I published with the Very Good Collab Book Project. Um, this one is Where Love Shines On. It's an LGBTQ plus romance anthology with stories by Holt Hughes, Hakobo, Lettercast, and Little. You can see here this cover, which I drew myself. And if you squint your eyes, these clouds turn into people kissing, which is, uh, I think, pretty cool effect, but not intuitive, so. It is what it is. Where Love Shines On is a collection of nine romantic short stories and six poems. These works, submitted by five queer authors, explore love and romance between queer characters across a variety of genres, from fantasy to contemporary to science fiction. This anthology provides audience ratings and content warnings for each story. There's also a special thanks section at the end of the book to thank the previous authors and the people who helped the very good pro collab team throughout our publishing journey. Inside, you will find debut stories by Alice Little and Lee Holt, stories from returning authors Zach Lettercast and Braden Hughes, and a submission by the Very Good team's newest author, Ty Kobo. This is the third and final Very Good Collab Books anthology. This was the first time that I really went whole hog with my book content um, and the way that I formatted it. I mean, look at that font. So, and then I also really made sure to include content, like tags and content warnings at the very beginning of the book and then at the beginning of each story because different things appeal to different readers. This is a like queer inclusive anthology, which means that I've got stuff for ace people and then I've also got stuff for allosexual people. Um, I wanted to make sure that people weren't walking into stories that they were uncomfortable reading. So yeah. We've got uh, The Edge of the Rainbow by Lee Holt, Gravity to the Power of Three by Zach Lettercast, Erotic Flash, Flash Fiction by Braden Hughes, Poetry by Zach Lettercast, The Eternal Court, A Princess's Curse by Ty Hakobo, 
and Stumbling Into Love by Alice Little. The end of each section has an about the author or also by, depending on what's necessary. And of course, the beginning has the tags. Like I said, I really went all out with the formatting on this book. I mean, isn't that awesome? I included, I managed to figure out how to include text message formatting in the books. And then I include tags, like for the poetry, for the poem Kate, tags, sapphic, gritty, you know, things that you would find if you were, if you were reading like fan fiction or whatever. And then for the poetry, I made it look like handwriting which I'm super, super proud of. And then I also included separators between each story. So that way, if you're reading the end of one thing and you don't want to see the beginning of another thing, you don't have to. I really liked it. And there are different separators for each person, each author. And of course, this is the first time I ever included a map in a book and people loved it, including myself. So this was like my piece de resistance in terms of like making anthologies. My queer polyamorous romance is in there, it's called Gravity to the Power of Three, and it focuses on three people aboard the seed ship Verena way before, you know, the events of It Feeds, like I'm talking hundreds of years where it's just kind of starting out in its journey and a professor is woken up from hypersleep and he meets two people and they, all three of them, fall in love and navigate things like disability and grief. It's a really, really good story. I think it's pretty freaking solid, honestly. Uh, and I wish that I had a copy to show you guys, but apparently I don't, which is kind of like a little bit weird, but yeah. So I actually published the whole thing, I think, at the beginning of this year or the very end of last year. Like, I published that story individually um, well after I published this whole set of Where Love Shines On. Alright, so that was the summer. That was our, like, Pride Month release. And then we go into our spooky Halloween releases. Um, I have Desert Castle here. I'm super proud of this cover. You can hate it if you want. I love how extra and insane it is. I did that on purpose. This story came to me in 2017 or 2016 when I was uh, first began working at the Sherry's Ranch in Pahrump and uh, people were talking about the place being haunted and I definitely being out there in the desert being in that environment felt like I was in a place in between worlds I felt like I was kind of like stepping through the veil not in terms of it being haunted because I don't really believe in that but more of like this sort of ethereal concept that when people come to visit us there, they are not uh, who they usually are in the material world. They become a lot more esoteric concepts than physical humans. And I also am embodying a lot of concepts for these people. And we're becoming and engaging in this sort of like otherworldly experience together. And also, being there, I'm telling you, is like being in the land of the Fae. You, you leave the real world, you step into this ranch, and you're there for one to three weeks, and you have a completely different life. Everything is so topsy-turvy compared to like the outside world, the real world. It's a completely different set of rules, and when you come home, it's, it's almost like waking up from a dream. Like, your experiences just don't feel very tangible and they're hard to grasp. Not all the time, but often. Um, and vice versa, when you're in that environment, grasping things from the real world is just like, almost like a foreign concept. So that's kind of what bred Desert Castle. And Desert Castle, well, I'll just read it to you. Uh, it's a little bit difficult to read, obviously, because I got this no, not for resale band across, but I'll do my best. Dive into a riveting blend of fantasy, horror, and mystery, where every chapter is a doorway to forbidden knowledge and age-old secrets. Will Cerulean and his allies stand firm, or will they be consumed by the shadows they fight? Discover a tale where destiny isn't preordained, but forged through choices and alliances. From whimsical castle bordellos to the ethereal battles of the celestial kind, the narrative explores power dynamics, desires, and the balance between fantasy and reality with elements of gothic romance, erotic fiction, mythology, and psychological thriller. 
The story keeps readers engaged with its uh, tantalizing interactions and forbidden secrets. It definitely takes on all kinds of plot twists that you would not expect, and I think it's really uh, a thought-provoking piece. So next we've got Distant Tales, which is an anthology that I participate in uh, every year. Distant Tales 2 should be out by the time this video comes out, but uh, if it's not, it will be out in October of 2024. So this is Distant Tales 1. I have qualms with the cover design, but uh, ultimately it was not up to me. The first ever thriller and suspense anthology hosted by Storydown Publications. We introduced Matt Coble and host Zach Glittercast. This anthology introduces a pair of sus suspenseful tales that will keep readers on the edge of their seats, from heart-pounding thrillers that grip the very fabric of the reader's imagination, to challenging the very ideals of the human psyche. With storytelling that goes through the human experience, both authors created narratives that blur the lines between reality and fiction. Distant Tales. Let's talk about it. Let's talk about the publishing company uh, that produced Distant Tales, Story Den. Story Den Publications is a very small little indie, hybrid indie publishing group that my best friend Tiana has started and has included me in um, as kind of a co-founder position. I edit, I beta read, and uh, I format for Story Den. Neither of us gets paid to do this, um, but we both are really passionate about helping authors bring their dreams to life. This was before my introduction as a formatting consultant, so there are some things in here that are a little rough. It's missing page numbers, the formatting is very, very basic, but it gets the job done. So By the Light of the Spider is by Matt Coble. Matt initially was going to write on my anthology, Arachnopocalypse. By the Light of the Spider takes place in Arachnopocalypse universe, just to talk about it. So I do consider it Arachnopocalypse canon. So By the Light of the Spider by Matt Coble. The tale of a renegade mad scientist who stole technology from a fanatical church and now spends her days modifying native wildlife with hybrid mutations and mechanical enhancements. It is clear from the start that she is brilliant but unbalanced, with goals that make sense only to herself. She talks to a hybrid pet spider that may or may not be intelligent enough to understand her. A pair of heavily armed religious fanatics are pursuing her and manage to breach her underground lab where they must fight through her experiments to reach her. Academy Nowhere by Zach Lettercast. In the shadowed aftermath of global cataclysm, Beatrice navigates a treacherous landscape of lost dreams, enduring friendship, and unspoken love. She's thrust into the cold halls of the enigmatic Academy Nowhere an oppressive force seeks to mold her to where an oppressive force seeks to mold her into an obedient soldier. With each chapter, Beatrice's spirit is tested against the stark backdrop of dystopian science fiction, heart-wrenching connections, and chilling moral quandaries. From desperate battles against monstrous foes to confrontations with the very essence of her identity, she is faced with choices that challenge the core of her, her humanity. As mysteries unravel and allegiances shift, will Beatrice find the strength to defy her fate and reclaim her destiny. Dive into a world where the boundaries blur between survival and sacrifice and where hope teeters on the knife edge of despair. Distant Tales 2 is going to be a lot thicker than this because we actually got a lot more submissions this year and I am pumped for it. I am so excited to be sharing even more stuff with you guys. Distant Tales 2 will include the original two stories from Distant Tales 1 because that was kind of an agree agreement that we made with Matt and myself as being part of the the, the pilot program for Story Den. So let's talk about Academy Nowhere, which is included in Distant Tales, but I published a special edition separately um, that is available only to people who subscribe to my Patreon or who know me in person and have like ordered a signed personal copy. The blurb is the same. Um, I did design this cover myself. I drew it, uh, the front anyway, and this back piece is actually photos that I took, a photo I took myself uh, at White Sands in New Mexico, and of course there's me uh, with just some like general Canva art in the background. Right, so let's talk about it. Let's talk about this special edition. This limited special edition includes a foreword and afterward by the author, and it actually talks about how I came up with the story, um, its origins, and what it looks like, and my original planning phase back in, gosh, 2015. Also talks about TV and Santana, and it mentions as well uh, Green Apple Day, which is February 3rd. You can learn about why I have dubbed February 3rd Green Apple Day and the story behind that and why you should 100% 
sent Ty Hakobo on Facebook, link in the description, uh, picture of Green Apple on February 3rd. Every year, just do it, just spam her. And of course, it's got my dedications. To T. Van Santana for beta reading the awful original version of, version of the story and still being nice to me, you're a saint. I'm sorry we lost touch, but your critiques quite literally changed my life. And to Ty Hakobo for being my friend for even longer than the first draft of the story sat untouched in a Google Drive folder. So there's a lot of really cool personal content in here in addition to the story, um, and it's only available on Patreon. All right, the last two things that I've published thus far are um, things that I actually edited on and did consulting for the cover and I did the formatting of. So Understanding Jehovah's Witnesses uh, by Owen Morgan and its companion book, 100 Questions for Jehovah's Witnesses. Owen Morgan is a fellow YouTuber here and you can find him on his many channels. Just type in Owen Morgan into the YouTube uh, search bar and you will find he's got a few different channels where he debunks uh, religious extremism and talks about religion and cults. Um, unfortunately, there's been a huge intersection in the past decade. I mean, there's, it's always happened where, you know, religion and politics have kind of like overlapped, especially since the like revival period of the 60s. However, um, things have become so inextricably linked that now he's also a political YouTuber and I'm sure he's got feelings about that. But he hosts this YouTube channel and he does a great job of it and he is a ex Jehovah's Witness um, and so he wrote this very thick book. I mean, she is, she is dense. 384 pages including citations um, and yes, there are citations for all of the claims that he makes in this book. Um, it analyzes scripture, it analyzes uh, claims made by the governing body of Jehovah's Witnesses. And yeah, so let's, let's read the back matter, and uh, this is kind of the last piece here that I've got going on. If you've made it this far, thank you. Uh, who are Jehovah's Witnesses? What do they believe? How did the religion start? Being born into a religion of Jehovah's Witnesses gave me a unique insight into the group. It's an insight that might be difficult for outsiders to access. Few outsiders understand the religion of Jehovah's Witnesses, I mean, really understand them. As you walk with me through the group's history and my own personal experiences, I hope to remove their enigmatic nature and give you a glimpse into the mindset of a Jehovah's Witness. If you're already a Jehovah's Witness, I hope you'll take the information in this book in good faith. I don't intend to tear anybody down or hurt feelings. I want to pierce the veil. This book does not challenge Christianity. It does, however, challenge the Christian denomination of Jehovah's Witnesses. The last chapter contains 100 questions for Jehovah's Witnesses, questions that the governing body has yet to answer. Let's talk about some of the most fascinating questions one could ask about the religion of Jehovah's Witnesses. 100 Questions is in the back of this book. 100 Questions is good to have, and it's actually available as an open source document as a PDF on his website. This is good to have for if you have JWs knocking on your door, invite them in, provide them with this book, and just go through it, ask the questions, you know? And it's got not just questions, but like scripture and historical um, citations that are really important in challenging the ideology of Jehovah's Witnesses. And then, of course, the back matter for this one. My name is Owen Morgan. I was born into the Jehovah's Witnesses religion. After investigation, I have some questions that have been left unanswered. I'm asking Jehovah's Witnesses to consider these fundamental questions. If this is the truth, Jehovah's Organization will stand up to close examination. We are all looking for accurate information. My intent in writing this booklet is not to offend or attack. I don't want to hurt anybody. I simply want answers. Signed, your loving brother, Owen Morgan. Um, which is like a really good like call toward uh, any JWs who might end up picking up this book. Um, and he wanted to format it and make it look very much like JW's um, typical content because that will appeal to a Jehovah's Witness audience. And I uh, just want to show off, he signed my copy which makes me really happy. Um, so yeah, and I got to participate in the, like I said, I edited and formatted um, all several hundred uh, pages of these books, so I know them kind of intimately. Um, and of course I did consult on the cover design, uh, but Owen did ultimately have final say on how, how he wanted those to look. So if you've made it this far, you are amazing and weirdly interested in my books, and I love and appreciate you. You can find most of my book content available for free on my website at ilettercast.com in PDF format. You can also, though, access my books and purchase them on pretty much anywhere that you find books, including Amazon, Barnes & Noble, uh, Walmart, you know, books, they're everywhere. 
Um, I eventually would like to get my books into libraries and into like local bookstores. I just don't know what the process of that looks like and honestly I have not had time to figure it out. So if you have advice, I would love to see it in the comments below. I have books coming out next year, I'm just working on them. It's been a pretty hefty long haul uh, to get uh, my novel out uh, and edited and decent and it's still not done to be honest. Um, and then I have another novel, which is still more of like an anthology style novel. It, it, it comes in parts uh, that I hope to release uh, by 2026. I've been working on it since 2020, so it has to come out eventually, um, but I figured I'd just let you guys know. And then I am taking a break from poetry, uh, publication. I've just been sort of playing around with style. I know this is very runny right now, give me one second. I have been playing around a lot with uh, style and content and deciding kind of like what it is that I want to share with the public. Um, my mom's passing at the beginning of this year really uh, heavily impacted my ability to create, to be honest. Um, and I ended up taking about <clears throat> I ended up taking about six months off of doing really any kind of writing work. Um, and I've I've really been trying to get back into my weekly habit of writing every Saturday, and it's been slow going. Um, I did graduate with my bachelor's degree in February of this year, and I have since started grad school as well as picked up a job, so things have been a little bit hectic, but uh, I'm working on it. And uh, yeah, so I love and appreciate you. If you like what you saw today and you want to see more, hit that button down below. Subscribe, become a member of the Jackalope Tribe, Lettercast Clan, what are we feeling? How do we want it? I don't know. Give me, give me, let me know in the dis uh, comments. Let me know what you think um, we should call our little group here. Um, and thank you again so much for watching. I look forward to seeing you soon. Talk to you later.